So hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining our talk. We are very excited to be here in Stockholm. You have a very beautiful city. So today we are going to talk about uh, container escape of how to abuse container capabilities to perform container escapes. So first, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ilan Sokol. I live in Haifa, Israel. I'm a security research team lead in the cyber reason. Uh, before cyber reason, my work was focused on research in the offensive security field. And as a result, I understand the malicious operations prevalent in the current threat landscape. Uh, I'm passionate about reverse engineering and malware analysis, but also interested uh, in offensive aspects such as vulnerability research. Hi everyone, my name is Eran Ayalon. I'm security research team lead at Cyber Reason. My main specialty is detecting different attack frameworks on multiple operation systems, for example, Windows, Linux, and cloud uh, environments. I started my career seven years ago in the Israeli Air Force, where I was part of a team that was specialized in performing threat hunting, incident response, and digital forensics. So that's us, and let's begin with our presentation. So before we dive into the details, let's do a quick background. So cyber attacks is not just about the endpoint anymore. Until a few years ago, most of the cyber attacks were mainly focused around the endpoint area. However, new technologies like mobile phones, IoT devices, and cloud infrastructures has changed the entire way that the industry works. It also changed the cyber attacks. Containers are now being used by almost every organization for its day-to-day -day operation, and therefore con containers have become a prime target for hackers, and security experts must be familiar with this field. So let's talk a, a little bit about the container attack surface. So the container attack surface is slightly different uh, from the familiar endpoint attack surface. There are some attacks that related to container that don't even take place inside of the container. Those attacks are take place outside of the container, for example, on the management host, and by abusing some management tools like kubectl or Docker, hackers can perform malicious activities, for example, discover other containers around the machine, or execute direct commands into the container, or even performing secret theft attack. On the other end, we have attacks that take place inside of the container. Those attacks may be caused by several reasons, for example, taking advantage of vulnerable container setup, or a Docker runtime exploit, or even taking advantage of misconfiguration. And of course, we have the famous container escape. The container escape is considered as the holy grail of the container attack surface. It's the perfect endgame for hackers and allow them to break out from the, from the isolated container to the host machine, and by that, getting access to the entire data that is located on the host. It also allows them to move laterally around the machine and the network as well. So to truly understand the concept of containers uh, and the specific attack vectors, the first step is to recognize that, uh, mo that containers are not virtual machines, but rather techniques of restricting processes on a machine using various isolation mechanisms. So what is the difference between them? Uh, the primary dis distinction between a virtual machine and a container is that a virtual machine has its own virtualized kernel, whereas the container utilizes the host kernel. The container runs the user mode portion of the operation system and can be tailored to contain just the needed services for your app using fewer system resources. In, in contrast to containers, virtual machines uh, run a complete operation system, including the kernel, thus requiring more system resources, such as CPU, memory, and storage. Uh, here we can see an illustration of how containers or virtual machines are utilized on the endpoint. So uh, if any of you have seen the metrics, we hope you appreciate the reference from the scene, there is no spoon. So there is no container. It is just another process running on your machine uh, using various isolation mechanisms. So let me introduce some of these isolation mechanisms. This is just a few. So firstly, we have namespaces. Namespaces are one of the technologies in which containers are, containers are built. Namespaces are abstraction layers that provide processes with their own view of the system and its resources. Namespaces limit what process can see and use as it provides isolation. Next, we have uh, control groups, aka C groups. It is a Linux feature, uh, Linux kernel feature that restricts and isolates a collection of program resource utilizations, such as CPU, mem mem uh, memory network, and so on. 
Uh, then we have SECOMP, which is an acronym of Secure Computing Mode. Uh, this kernel feature allows us uh, to restrict actions available within a container down to the granularity of a single system call. And lastly, we have capabilities. So what are capabilities? Uh, capabilities provide the ability to give a specific set of privileges to a third process. They do so by breaking down the dichotomy between a privileged and unprivileged that embodies all or nothing into logical groups of privileges. All privileged actions have been thought out and categorized into approximately 40 capabilities. That means that a process or thread can use uh, a small set of action uh, for only those that are needed, lowering the danger of abuse uh, to unexpected behaviors. In other words, the purpose of capabilities is to divide root privileges into distinct ones. Uh, capabilities can be applied to container processes, and in this way, all processes part of the container can inherit its capabilities. So uh, what happens when a capability is assigned to a container or, uh, or a process? Uh, the call thread can execute a set of system calls associated with this capability. We can see some examples of system calls that are directly connected to a capability, for example, init module and delete module, uh, which are responsible for installing a deleting module inside the kernel. They are associated with sys module capability. Uh, we can see a ptrace and process vm write v system calls directly associated with sys ptrace capability and mk node associated with mk node capability. So uh, all groups of this capability combined together will be considered as root privilege and will make a complete set of permitted system calls. Uh, here you can see an example of how capabilities enables the breakdown of the dichotomy between root and non-root uh, privileges. So you're probably wondering to yourself where are those capabilities actually stored. Uh, when the process is created, it dynamically allocates a task stru structure. So let's take a look at the structure on the left. Uh, this data structure contains all the information to manage a process, such as process ID, uh, its stack, and a pointer to a parent process. Uh, but the most uh, interesting part for our talk is the CREST structure uh, at the bottom of the structure. You can see it on the right. Uh, so uh, this structure holds the security context uh, uh, stuff for uh, the task. This structure, uh, so uh, we have the UID, the GID, and the SUID, and lastly we have the five capability sets. So uh, this is the five capability sets we have. Firstly, we have the inheritable, the bounding, and the ambient, but the most important for our talk is the effective capability set. Uh, this is the capability set that the kernel looks at when it tries to execute specific system calls. Another important capability set we have is the permitted capability set. This set holds the capability that can easily become effective using few, uh, some system calls. So which capability should we use? Uh, to determine which capability should we use, we need to monitor uh, which system calls our containerized app is using. Then we can inspect the source code of the system call and look at the security checks that are usually located at the beginning of the function. Uh, one of the security checks that the function performs is whether the permissions of the task allows the execution of the function by running the kernel function capable. The capable function receives the name of the capability as an argument and returns true if the current task has given the capability currently available for use and false if not. Uh, in this example, we can see the init module uh, system call, which is responsible for installing kernel module in the kernel. You can see that after initialization of some variable, variables, it uh, calls the main init module function uh, that calls the capable function to check whether the CAPSIS module capability is available or not. So by default, container D and Docker runtime start their uh, container with those limited set of capabilities. You can see here very important capabilities that in charge of very uh, important uh, actions of the system. Uh, for example, you can see here the capabilities of uh, set GAD and UID and the cap net bind and net row, which are capabilities that in charge the entire network functionality of the process. 
It also worth mentioning that Kubernetes uses container D by default. So actually, those limited set of capabilities are actually can by default on new Kubernetes container, on every new Kubernetes container. So how we can control our capabilities uh, in our containers? So here you can see the command line that you can use to control your capabilities. You just need to execute the docker run command with the parameter uh, cap add or drop, depends on the action that you want to perform, and uh, list the capabilities that you want to change. Uh, you, can just, you can also just write all to do this action for the entire uh, effective capabilities. In Kubernetes, uh, we can control our capabilities using the security context field. Uh, it's very easy to use. You can take a look at the snippet and see that in uh, this example, uh, in the security context field, we add the sysmodule capability and drop kill capability. So now let's talk about privileged container. By default, container don't have any access to any of the devices that is located on the host. However, when container runs in privilege mode, it has access to the entire of the devices that is located on the host. When container runs in privilege mode, the entire isolation mechanism is being removed. You can basically say that having a privileged container is equal to having application with root privileges. You can also see the command line that you can use to create a privileged container. In Kubernetes, we also using the security context field. You just need to set the privilege flag to true, and you've got yourself a new Kubernetes privileged container. So you probably wonder to yourself how to discover those capabilities. So container capabilities can be viewed by reading the content of the main cont uh, container process, which is usually represented as PID1. Uh, you can see the effective capability set highlighted in yellow. Uh, the capability displayed as bitmask, and each bit in the bitmask represents different capability. So uh, here you can see a snippet uh, from uh, uh, capability header on Linux source code. Uh, you can see that uh, Capsis model is responsible for in inserting and removing kernel modules, and uh, Capsis ptrace uh, can allow us uh, ptrace to another process. And this is how we can decode it. So uh, the most popular tool to discover and debug capabilities is CapSH. It is not available by default. It needs to be installed on the machine. Uh, using CapSH tool, we can decode the bitmask. So we can install inside the, consider, uh, inside the container the CapSH tool, run CapSH print, and we will receive the available cap capabilities in clear text. Uh, but this is, this is not a good practice because smart attacker will never do uh, such a thing. So we can copy the bitmask to our local machine and the attacker machine and decode it using CapSH decode command and receive the available capabilities in clear text. Cool. So now we've got to the most uh, interesting part of our uh, presentation, the use cases. We are about to show you a couple of demos that will demonstrate how we can take a simple process capability and abuse it to break out from, con from the isolated container. Um, our starting point in each of the scenarios will be with a remote code execution uh, inside of the container. Like we mentioned earlier, there are several ways for hackers to break into the container. We are not going to focus on this phase of the attack uh, in this uh, presentation. We will starting, like I said, already with an RCE inside of the container. So let's see the first demo. Our first demo is going to focus the CAPSIS module capability. CAPSIS module is the capability that in charge of loading and unloading kernel modules in the system. To perform this action, it uses the init module and the lit module syscalls. Our minimum requirements for this uh, attack is having either of privileged container or, or having a container with the CAPSIS module effective on it. To perform the attack, we will going to uh, install a new kernel module. And to do this action, we will need to execute the init module syscall. So you have to make sure that you don't have any up armor or other policy that will prevent this uh, syscall uh, from being executed. Here you can see the command line that you can use to start a new uh, container with the CAPSIS module effective on it. So uh, let me describe the attack flow that you are about to see. We will start, we'll start, like I said, with an RCE inside of a container where we are going to compile a new kernel module that will share the source code in a minute. 
In the kernel module, we are going to use a function that named call user mod helper function. This function allows user to execute command lines in the user space area. And it also gets as an argument the command line that we want to execute. We are going to use a simple bash command line to create a reversal from the container to the attacker. Because it's a kernel module and it's being executed directly from the kernel, the reversal will start automatically uh, with root privileges. Here's the source code uh, of the reversal. You can see here the simple bash command line and the call user mod helper function. Now let's see the video. Cool. So the attacker starts a listener on his Kali machine. And now inside of the container, uh, the attacker reads the main process container status, usually is going to be PID1, to see which capabilities are effective. Now we are copying the CAPFF bitmask to get the list of the entire capabilities that are effective in our container. We are decoding the bitmask using CAPSH decode. And here's the list. We can see that CAPSYS module is effective, which means that we're able to install kernel modules and means that we can continue with our attack. Now let's see the source code of the kernel module that we are about to compile. Here you can see the bash command line for the reverse shell with the attacker IP address and port and the call user mod helper function. Now we are going to compile this kernel module using make command. Before do is doing this action, you have to make sure that you have the matching kernel headers. Now we just need to install the kernel module. So we are using the ins mode command. And at this point, you can see that a new reverse shell was being created uh, on the Kali machine. You can also see that we have root privileges and that we are located on the host, which means that we successfully break out from the container. Thank you, Aran. Uh, so uh, in this demo, we're going to demonstrate how to escape from uh, container by abusing the CAPSYS P-Trace capability. Uh, the CAPSYS P-Trace capability is very interesting because it gives us the ability to, to transfer data between processes by uh, executing process VM read V and process uh, VM uh, write V system calls. In addition, it allows us to trace arbitrary processes using P-Trace. So uh, P-Trace is a system call that allows the process to monitor and control the execution of another process and debug it, in debug it. So in order to carry out such an attack, we will assume that we already have an access to the container or possibility to perform remote code execution. So uh, let's discuss the minimal requirements uh, to pull off this kind of attack. Firstly, the container must be started with the option PID equals host flag. This turns on the sharing between container and the host operation system with the PID address space. Uh, then we need to start the container with uh, either privilege flag or CAPSYS P-Trace capability. Uh, it is important to know the different container runtimes apply different app armor policies, and to perform this attack, we need to verify that the policy allows us to execute P-Trace system call. So uh, here is the command we use to spin up this vulnerable container. Uh, we can see the security option uh, app armor unconfined. That means that uh, no app armor profile is applied. Uh, we added CAPSYS P-Trace capability and PID equals host, which allows us the sharing of the memory space. So this is the attack flow we are going to perform in this attack. Uh, uh, we will use GDB, which is a Linux debugger, uh, which allows us to see what is going on inside of another program while it executes. GDB is going to attach to the host process, which is running with root privileges. And uh, it will try to execute a simple bash reverse shell from it. As a result, it will spawn a bash reverse shell as a child process with the same privileges as the parent process. That means we will run with root privileges on the host machine outside of the container. So we start, start a listener on the attacker machine. Now we will list the available capa capabilities inside of the container. 
we will copy the effective capability, we will decode them, and then we will see that CAPSIS ptrace capability is available inside of the container. Now we are going to list uh, the processes because we are sharing the same uh, address space with the host machine. We can see uh, processes running on the host machine. We see gedit running uh, root, with root privileges. We'll copy its PID. We'll attach GDB, GDB to this process. And now we can debug it. We can run whatever we want inside of this process. And for this, per for this demo, we're going to execute simple bash reverse shell inside this gedit process. Because it's running with root, shell process will be with root either. So at this point, we receive the reverse shell to the attacker. We're running on the host machine with root privileges. And we successfully escape from the container. So you probably run to yourself, can this happen in real life? So the answer is yes. We crawled GitHub and we looked for a project that uh, asked you to uh, spin up containers with these vulnerable setups. So the first example is NordVPN. If you want to run NordVPN in containerized, uh, in containerized mode, they ask you to run it with CAPSIS uh, module capability. As you, as you saw in Aaron's demo, we can easily escape from this container. Here is another example of a container running with, with privileged flag, a Kubernetes pod running with privileged, privileged flag. And in this example, we can see Apache HTTP server running with privileged flag. That means that if someone uh, receives uh, a web shell inside of, this, uh, uh, inside of this server, it can easily escape from this container to the host machine. So uh, during our research on machine learning uh, script classifiers, uh, we encountered, uh, encountered an interesting uh, script that uh, targeted one of our clients. This is an automated container escape script. The, they use the same method as we show you, uh, that we showed you before. It is looking for uh, CAPSIS admin capability to perform automated uh, container escape after it. So you may think that your container is completely secured, but something small as CAPSIS admin capability can make your com container completely vulnerable. So the most known threat group that is related to the uh, container attacks is named Team TNT. Team TNT active since October 19, almost four years ago. Uh, their, their main specialty is taking advantage of containerized environment to deploy uh, their crypto miners uh, attack. So um, here's an example of threat alert that taken from Twitter that describes a new uh, Team TNT uh, Kubernetes malware. Uh, another blog back by uh, Aqua Security about a uh, new uh, Team TNT malware uh, that uh, attacks cloud environments. And another blog by uh, Unit 42 Palo Alto about new uh, crypto hijacking malware that targets Kubernetes. The thing that's common to each of the, these threat alerts is that in all of them, uh, Team TNT using uh, similar methods uh, to the attacks that we showed you earlier. So we, we want you to understand that these, those attacks are really happened in real life, and security experts must be familiar with them, with those. So uh, probably you wonder why Team, T, Team TNT and other uh, hackers want so badly uh, targets Kubernetes environments. So Kubernetes environments are considered as environments that have access to massive amount of data. Um, usually uh, databases and web applications are stored in those environments. Also, Kubernetes nodes are considered as very powerful objects, uh, which is good for the uh, crypto mining uh, activities uh, of the attackers. Also, there are lack of security products that can monitor the Kubernetes node itself. And in general, it's very cumbersome to manage uh, Kubernetes uh, environments in security aspects. So 
Hackers can benefit from all of the above to execute malicious operations in Kubernetes environments without almost any interruption of the defenders. So now let's talk about detection and see how we can detect those cool and amazing attacks that we just sh showed you. So during our research, we were collaborating with the MITRE organization. Uh, we shared with them our inputs on the escape to host technique. Um, and they liked our input and made us as an official contributors to the escape to host technique. So we can also uh, look for all our findings in the MITRE official website. So our first uh, suggestion for detection is try to monitor uh, the deployment of every new container image or pod in your environment, especially the one who runs with root privileges. You can also try to monitor uh, of suspicious uh, execution of system calls uh, that being executed inside of the container. You saw earlier how a simple execution of init module led to entire scenario of a container escape. Our last suggestion for detection is try to hunt for process activity, especially process that can be an indicator of attacker that tr try to break out from the isolated container to the host machine. So now let's talk about mitigation and see how we can minimize the risk to be affected by those attack. So our first and most important uh, recommendation is when you are creating a new container, first drop the entire capabilities and only after that, add the relevant capabilities that matches the purpose of your container. We also uh, recommend to minimize as much as possible the usage of privileged container and try to avoid the CAPSYS admin capability. You can also uh, use uh, policies like App Armor that can prevent uh, capabilities per specific programs. Kubernetes has policies that can uh, prevent the creation of uh, containers per specific cap capabilities. And of course, you can use the second filter for blocking specific uh, syscalls per capabilities. So I want to focus a little bit about the second BPF because we think this is a good mitigation for uh, these attacks. So uh, what is the second BPF? Uh, firstly, it, it is a JSON formatted structure uh, security profile which is implemented with the BPF technology. Uh, BPF, BPF allows us uh, in, kernel, in kernel selection of packets, and then, uh, therefore we can drop a selection of system calls. Uh, it can be considered as system call firewall because uh, uh, some capabilities uh, that allows, uh, allow the system calls will be executed, and the, the unpermitted will be denied. So, uh, as I, so if a system call will fail, the, progr the program will continue running. Uh, Docker runtimes allow us uh, to set second BPF filter to container by default. So this is a given feature. You don't have to install anything. So this is how second profile looks like. Uh, it is very similar to how uh, firewall policies look like. Uh, we have three available action. We have second action uh, allow, which allows system calls. We have second action error no, which denies system call. And second action log, which logs the unpermitted system calls. On the left, we can see the second profile JSON. We can see the default action is second action error no, which means uh, all uh, actions will be uh, automatic, uh, by default will be denied. And we have a list of al uh, allowed system calls with the action second allow. Uh, the default uh, second profile blocks uh, 44 system calls out of uh, more than 300. That means we need to harden our containers. And to apply second profile to container with Docker runtime, we just need to add a security option flag with the second profile JSON as an argument. So uh, uh, let's conclude this talk. So capability control invocation of system calls. As we saw, some system calls are directly associated with uh, cap capabilities. Uh, all capabilities combined together will be considered as root privilege. Uh, some of those system calls can lead to a container escape, as we saw in the demonstration. Uh, we have to be aware of the capabilities that are assigned to our container. We need to use the mitigation uh, process that we showed you before. Uh, and we should try to miti mitigate as much as possible the use of unnecessary capabilities. As Aran mentioned before, we need to drop all the capabilities and add only the relevant ones. Thank you. We hope you, enjoy, you, you enjoyed our talk. <laughs> okay.
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions from uh, the audience? Um, just raise your hand, don't be shy. Um, okay, then I'll start with the question. How common do you think the misconception is that, like, uh, as your slide shows, the, the difference between a, a VM and a container? I mean, to me, it seems there is a lot of confusion in the general public. Do you also see this when you come out to clients, etc.? Can, you, re can the, you repeat it? Uh, so, so, do you think it's a general misconception that the security boundaries and the difference between a, a proper VM or a virtualized host and a container? Yeah, I, I actually, we think that uh, a lot of people that don't familiar with the, the container uh, with container internals are. I was thinking that uh, containers and VM are and virtual machine are basically the same, and uh, it's actually very wrong. And uh, we need you need to you need to give a, a, every one of them a different attention. Yeah. yeah. Um, any more questions from the audience? There we have one. Yeah. Thank you for a great presentation. How about the uh, rootless Docker? You have versionless Podman as well. What? I couldn't hear, I'm sorry. Can you repeat? Uh, how about the uh, rootless Docker? You can run root being root inside a container. And uh, you, are, you, can't escape, you can't escape from the container if you are root just inside, uh, if you don't have the certain capabilities. Yeah. OK. Hey, thank you for a great talk. I have a question with something I've struggled a lot with while building these security contexts and limiting and restricting capabilities. Have you ever discovered any automated tools to identify which capabilities a container image might need, like a profiling tool? And if not, how would you go about discovering them without threading to, through all the source code? P-Trace? Sorry, just hard to hear, I'm sorry. <laughs> How would you go about discovering all the capabilities that a container image might need without going through all the source code manually? Uh, if I understand your question uh, right, you you want uh, how to discover the capabilities that we need uh, we need to add to our container? Okay, so our containerized app you can use uh, strace for example in Linux, and you can see all the system calls that are executed. All right, and you can uh, automate it using uh, like a dictionary or something that certain capabilities and the associated system calls. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you you had an ex as a examples. Ca uh, capability admin and uh, ptrace where you can escape the container uh, are there many more capabilities that you can use for escaping as well or are those the only two that you have identified no, th there are many more uh, uh, there are many more we just uh, introduced you two but uh, there are net admin and uh, there are much more Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, yeah, a big round of applause.